last speaker of the evening is Richard Heinberg. Richard is a senior fellow at the Post Carbon Institute and is widely regarded as one of the world's foremost peak oil educators. His work has appeared in several journals including Nature, The Ecologist, Earth Island Journal, European Business Review, and many others. His books include The End of Growth, Snake Oil, Peak Everything, Waking Up to the Century of Decline, the Oil Depletion Protocol, A Plan to Avert Oil Wars, Terrorism and Economic Collapse, and many others. He was a professor of human ecology at New College and is also a professional musician who has performed with string quartets. And tonight he delighted many of us with his beautiful violin playing at a reception. So thank you, Richard. He's speaking to us tonight on the topic of why resource depletion, climate change, and debt spell the end of economic growth. Please welcome Richard Heinberg. Well, first, a little bit about how I came to uh, this subject. Uh, this was a book that I read when I was 21 years old, back in 1972 when it first came out. It changed my life. And uh, just about everything I've done since then has been impacted by the experience of, of reading uh, limits to growth. It was, of course, uh, a report on an effort by scientists at MIT to use computers to model the likely interactions of uh, resources, resource availability, population, and, uh, and pollution over the course of uh, the next several decades. It was a modeling exercise or a scenario exercise. It wasn't an effort specifically to predict the future. Uh, but nevertheless, the scenarios that were produced, including the standard run scenario or, or business as usual scenario, were, were taken by many people to be uh, forecasts of, of future events. And as such, they were, they were pretty worrisome uh, because they, they showed especially the standard run scenario, showed a, a peak and decline in world industrial output sometime in the early 21st century. Mainstream economists hated this book, and they uh, very quickly put out uh, articles and, and uh, reports claiming that there are no limits to growth and that uh, uh, the, everything in the book was, was basically uh, rubbish. Now, of course, more recently, we have seen efforts to evaluate these limits to growth scenarios on the basis of several decades now of real world data. Uh, the most recent of these was at University of Melbourne. And you can see a, a, a short quote um, from Graham Turner there. So in fact, the, it's the standard run scenario or the most pessimistic of the scenarios that seems to be tracking actual data uh, most closely. So what I'd like to do this evening is outline how I think this all is unfolding now in real time, how the, the limits, how, how the limits to growth are converging on the world in, in real time. And I'm going to use three areas to, to zero in on that, energy, debt, and climate change. So first of all, energy. Um, energy is really the most important thing because without energy, nothing happens. We human beings have been using energy forever, as long as we've been here. But up until fairly recent times, the last couple of hundred years, our primary fuel was firewood, and our, our, primary, um, our primary way of changing the world around us, the primary way of exerting power into our environment, was muscle power. Of course, these are renewable 
energy sources or power sources, but they're, they're fairly limited. Now, what changes more recently, of course, is the fossil-fueled industrial revolution. And fossil fuels are absolutely unprecedented in, any, in energy terms. Uh, highly energy dense, they've been extremely cheap up to this point. Uh, in the case of oil, very portable. Really the ideal energy sources compared to anything that we had previously. One way you can intuitively gauge that for yourself is think back on maybe the last time you ran out of gas in your car and had to push your car off to the side of the road. You know, that's, that's hard work, but imagine pushing your car 20 or 30 miles. How much work would that be? Well, depending on the size of the person and the size of the car, let's say eight weeks of hard labor. But we get that done for us routinely by a single gallon of gasoline for which we're paying three or four dollars and complaining. But th think about that, the equivalent of eight weeks of hard human labor for three or four dollars. That's incredibly cheap energy and that's what has encouraged us and enabled us to mechanize almost every process of production and transport that we conceivably could have done over the past, uh, especially the last century. In effect, we discovered buried treasure and we went on a spending spree, and we're still on it. Uh, but fossil fuels, for all their incredible economic benefits, have a couple of drawbacks. Uh, one of which we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute, which is what happens when we burn them, what happens to the, to the atmosphere and the environment when we burn them. But the other drawback is simply that Fossil fuels are finite in quantity. They are a non-renewable resource. So as we dig them out of the ground and burn them, there's less left for future generations. This is what the oil industry looked like in the 1930s. This is what it looks like today. Something has changed. Something profound has changed in the oil industry. Uh, the, the rate at which we were uh, getting oil out of the ground historically over the past century was increasing at about 1.5 percent per year up until just the last decade and now the rate of increase has slowed substantially and if you were to uh, subtract unconventional oil from this graph you would actually see it declining from about 2005 onward so what's this business about unconventional oil versus conventional oil. Well, conventional oil is that stuff that we've been producing ever since 1859 with uh, regular vertical oil wells onshore. Unconventional oil takes an, a number of different forms, tar sands, uh, what folks in the industry call tight oil that's produced by hydrofracturing or fracking, deep water oil, polar oil, and so on. And as I, as I mentioned, most of the increase that we've seen, the paltry increase that we've seen over the past 10 years, has been in the form of unconventional oil. Meanwhile, the price of oil has gone through the roof. Of course, it's down a bit just over the past few weeks, but down to the 90s. But from any historic perspective, that's, that's a, a price that was completely unforeseen back in the early part of the last decade that uh, we'd be paying even $90 a barrel for oil. So what's going on here? Well, the, the industry is facing higher costs of production, and you can see it uh, in these figures here. They're investing substantially more upstream in exploration and production, but the increase in production that they're getting from those investments is declining. The, the law of diminishing returns bites hard in the oil world. But the world can't afford arbitrarily high oil prices. We know from uh, U.S. economic history that every time we've had a oil price shock, the U.S. economy has gone into recession as a result. 
So the oil industry actually needs higher prices than we have right now because costs are increasing at about 11% per year. So the oil industry would really like to have $120 a barrel oil right now, if it could, in order to finance more ultra-deep water oil, tar sands, and so on. But the economy evidently can't bear prices that high. They've pretty, pretty well maxed out. And so as a result, especially the larger oil companies are cutting back on in upstream investments because it, those investments just don't look uh, justifiable at this point. And you can see it in this graph from Wall Street Journal. Uh, the, the big major oil companies, again, uh, investments soaring, but production actually declining. Uh, the top five oil majors have seen their collective oil production decline by 25% in the last seven years. This, uh, this slide is worth meditating on for a while uh, because it shows schematically just what's going on here. You know, we, we go about extracting non-renewable resources like oil using the, the best first or low-hanging fruit principle. In effect, we're drilling down starting at the top of this resource pyramid. We start at the top with conventional resources that are cheapest to produce, highest quality resources. And then when those are effectively gone, what we're left it with is still the majority of the pyramid. We're not about to run out of oil or coal or natural gas. Uh, the Earth's crust still has a tremendous abundance of these fuels. The problem is that once you've burned through the conventional resources, what you have left is much more problematic. So that uh, big dotted white line there, the, the uh, technology price limit, that's pretty much where we are with oil right now. Yes, we could get more. We, we have the technology, but the technology costs money to implement and the price isn't quite there to justify the next increment of, of technology. But then the, the double white line, energy in equals energy out, that's, that's really crucial because when we get to that point, drilling, again, drilling down into the resource pyramid, it takes as much energy to explore, find, and produce a barrel of oil as the barrel of oil will give you when it's burned. So beyond that point, all the oil that's left in the Earth's crust may be useful as a lubricant, as a feedstock for plastics or uh, petrochemicals, various kinds, but it's not a fuel. It's not an economically useful fuel. So we're, we're moving in that direction. The energy returned on energy invested in producing oil is falling. It takes energy to get energy. And one of the miracles of fossil fuels historically has been that the amount of energy that, was, that had to be invested in production was minuscule, was trivial in comparison with the energy that we got out. Uh, in this country, the energy return on energy invested in oil production was about 30 to 1 just a couple of decades ago. It's currently less than 10 to 1 and falling rapidly. Well, 10 to 1 still sounds pretty good, right? I mean, if you, if you could invest $100 in a bank account, a uh, savings account, let's say, and, and get 1,000 back, that would be great, unless you know, you're talking centuries or something. Um, but with energy, it's a little different because everything we do uses energy, whether it's education or health care or transportation or agriculture or lighting and heating our buildings. All of these things use energy, but they don't produce any energy. So the trivial amount of energy that we invest in energy production has to be very productive. That's why we needed those 30 to 1 energy returns on energy investment but these days, we're not getting it. So what are the implications of declining EROEI? 
Well, look at these, these two graphs. This is, the, this is the energy system of society circa 1970. And you can see the, the energy input to the economy. And then in the lower right, uh, consumption. That's what we're really interested in. Uh, what, what energy does for us as, as consumers. Now, as the energy return on energy investment falls, the economy begins to look more like this. You need more energy inputs to the economy, but what's left over at the end of the day after the, the reinvestments are accounted for is a smaller level of consumption. That's the world toward which we're headed, one way or another. And it, it, it almost doesn't matter from an economic standpoint whether we continue using fossil fuels to the bitter end or make the energy transition to renewables. Of course, we need to do that, and I'll talk more about it in a, in a moment. But renewables typically have a lower energy return on investment than fossil fuels have had historically. So we're moving to a different kind of energy economy, one way or another, whether we plan for it or not. Now, you, you don't often hear in the mainstream media that we have an energy problem in this country because, in fact, we seem to have a glut of new energy sources from fracking, either shale gas or tight oil. And we're told that we have 100 years of cheap natural gas as a result of hydrofracturing. We're told that the US is about to become the, the next Saudi Arabia. Well, <clears throat> these, are, these are hefty claims. We at, at uh, my organization, Post Carbon Institute, decided to check these claims against reality. So we hired the data, uh, purchased the rights to the data for every currently producing shale gas and tight oil well in the country, over 65,000 of them. We looked at uh, the location of each well, initial production rates, and the evolution of production from each well over time uh, after drilling. And what we found was that uh, all of these wells have a very high decline rate, often in the range of 70% per year. So that means if you drill a well in January, by December of that same year, your production rate from that well has already fallen by 70%. That means that producers have to drill and drill and drill in order to keep their overall production from collapsing. And that's what's been happening. We hear so much about the, uh, the public backlash against fracking. The reason we do so is because it takes the drilling of tens of thousands of wells to make a difference. If it were only a few wells, take a country like Iraq or Saudi Arabia, a few wells in a supergiant oil field can produce literally millions of barrels per day. Here we're talking about much lower initial production rates and rapid fall off production and therefore the requirement of tens of thousands of wells and thousands being drilled each year just to keep production from collapsing. So the, here with natural gas, what we see is the number of wells increasing dramatically and the average productivity of each well falling off dramatically as conventional natural gas depletes and goes away and we rely increasingly on unconventional or shale gas produced by hydrofracturing. Uh, this is the situation with tight oil, and uh, the, the big white area is what the EIA, the Energy Information Administration of the U.S. Department of Energy, says uh, we're going to get out of U.S. Uh, tight oil. We disagree with the EIA pretty strongly on their, their forecast. It looks to us like the, 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 uh, the, the tight oil bubble is going to burst within the next two years. We've already had a little run-in with the EIA. Just recently, they, a couple, couple of years ago, I should say, they, they, they uh, were asked to estimate the, the reserves of U.S. shale oil in the Monterey Basin. And they hired a uh, consulting company to do the, the, uh, the report which, which the EIA published. 
uh, forecasting you know, there, there would be something like 15 billion barrels of reserves in the Monterey Basin. We looked at that report and thought it was um, uh, somewhat lacking, to say the least. So we, uh, we assigned our staff petroleum geologists to look at, at, the, uh, at the actual drilling data in the Monterey Basin. And, and the geology. And what we came up with was, was a report that, that deeply questioned the, the EIA uh, methodology and, uh, and reserves figures and suggested that the actual reserves would be a very small fraction of that 15 billion barrels. A few months later, the EIA very quietly updated its reserves from 15 billion barrels to 0 0.6 billion barrels in the, in the Monterey Basin. So we think that basically the same thing is happening with tight oil and shale gas generally in the U.S. Uh, yes, it's true. We have seen very substantial new production from these sources, but only as a result of frantic and unsustainable rates of drilling. And once the sweet spots are drilled out, and they're being drilled out very quickly, the, the core areas within each play then it's no longer going to be possible to maintain growth rates and we'll see a collapse of production over a fairly short amount of time. Uh, this is a pic picture of the tar sands up in uh, Alberta and it's a, this used to of course be a beautiful boreal forest. Uh, as we drill deeper into the resource pyramid, the environmental risks and consequences are worse with every step of the way as we move down the pyramid. And also with tar sands, we note that the energy return on energy invested is quite low, about five to one. That's a level that probably is too low to support an industrial society. In other words, if the only energy source we had currently was the tar sands in Canada, society would collapse for, for economic reasons. It wouldn't be obvious to everyone what was going on. It, the, the economy just would stop working the way we're accustomed to. So we have a problem with energy. Very clearly, the kind of economy that we have built over the past hundred years is no longer going to work. Well, what's, what's going on with debt? Well. It actually is very closely related to the story I just told you. How so? Because in the early 20th century, with cheap fossil fuels, with cheap, abundant, transportable, concentrated energy, it was possible for us to increase the rate at which we extracted raw materials from the earth and transformed them into consumer products. A few inventions helped along the way, including the powered assembly line. So the problem in the early 20th century was one of overproduction. We could make stuff in larger quantities and faster than people were accustomed to buying stuff. So what was the solution to that? Well, one solution was advertising talking people into wanting more stuff than they realized they needed. So advertising, of course, has become a huge industry over the course of the last century and has adopted all of the, uh, uh, the findings of, of psychology. And there's a you know, long history to this of how the advertising industry um, became the, the, the shaper of the American consciousness and global consciousness to a very large degree. But Advertising itself wasn't enough. People could be talked into wanting more stuff, but they couldn't afford to buy it. Most people in the early 20th century bought consumer products with cash. And when it came to big ticket items like automobiles, most people just didn't have enough cash to go out and buy one. So one of the great innovations that helped with the problem of over overproduction was consumer credit. Helping people go into debt so they could consume now and pay later. So during the course of the 20th century, consumer debt increases and increases and increases. Now, something happens in the 1980s. There's a kind of, of fluctuation point 
And uh, the economist Robert Gordon noted that in his paper from a couple of years ago that was, is the U.S. economic growth over. This, this paper, was, which was published in a prominent, prominent academic journal, uh, was immediately, you know, pounced upon by his fellow economists and others, you know, said, well, maybe he's got something here. Well, I won't try to uh, um, outline the whole paper for you, but just to point out that he, he focuses in on the 1980s as being a period when the whole system started to change. Well, what happened in the 1980s? Well, globalization begins as a result of some innovations like container ships and computerized monitoring of inventories, uh, satellite communications. Now, American factory workers are competing directly with factory workers on the other side of the planet. So that has, that has the effect of depressing wages for U.S. workers. So inflation-adjusted hourly wages for American workers really haven't grown since the 1970s. So if wages aren't increasing, how are people supposed to buy more stuff? And by this time, we have a consumer economy. Consumerism is not just a proclivity of, of uh, people who have you know, given up their, their souls to, to advertising. Consumerism is, is a system, a system that requires constantly increasing s consumer spending on manufactured products and services and, and so on. That's 70 percent of the economy by this point is consumer spending, and we need consumer spending to constantly grow in order to uh, increase the tax base so that there are more, more tax revenues for government in order to, uh, uh, so that, oops, so that there are, um, uh, returns on investment for, for investors so that there are more jobs for workers. Everybody's wanting the economy to grow by this point. But if wages are stagnating, how's that going to happen? Well, with more debt. So consumers actually starting, start going into even more debt at this point. And debt begins growing at a much faster rate than the overall economy. So this is what starts happening in the 1980s. And this is the result, as you can see. Of course, there are a lot of folks these days who are, are, are very worried about government debt. But government debt, which is the, the, the blue bit at the top, and that's only part of the overall situation. Are there limits to debt? It's an interesting question. Now, th theoretically, uh, you know, money is, is a human construct. And with uh, innovations in banking, such as Ellen Brown talks about and others, it's entirely possible that we could, we could fix this problem, but not without some, you know, fundamental changes to the system. As the system is right now, we are bumping up against a fundamental financial limit to the ability of the economy to continue growing. As you can see, we sort of hit the limits to debt in 2008. And in order to keep the, the system from imploding, the Federal Reserve with quantitative easing and, and the US federal government and other, other governments chipped in with, with bailouts and with uh, stimulus spending, and so the only category of debt that's grown substantially since that time is, is government debt. This uh, inspired quote, I think, really <laughs> sums up the, the situation we faced in 2008. And in fact, we're, we're still basically employing the same strategy in order to keep the economy afloat. Okay, now the, the third element I'm not maybe going to talk about to quite the same length because I, I assume all of you are already familiar with, with the situation uh, regarding climate change. We've all agreed as the nations of the world that we want to keep it to two degrees Celsius. We're already at about one degree. But even at one degree, we're seeing you know, unacceptable <clears throat> weather events. 
And again, even at one degree, we're seeing uh, economic impacts from extreme weather events that are no longer trivial. The insurance industry is uh, highly sensitive to this subject and is very interested in where all of this is going. Now, if we want to keep warming to two degrees centigrade, what do we have to do? Kevin Anderson of, of Tyndall Center for uh, Climate Change Research in, uh, in the UK has very helpfully done a carbon budget for the world's nations to show just how much we would have to actually cut carbon emissions, basically fossil fuel consumption, in order to stay within that, that two degrees of warming. He suggests that already industrialized nations like the US would have to cut at about 10% per year. Now, effectively, that means cutting our fossil fuel consumption by 10% per year. Uh, Kevin Anderson himself says this is incompatible with economic growth. I think he's absolutely right with that. No matter, no matter how we cut fossil fuel consumption, if, if we do it at 10% per year, we're not going to be growing the economy. Okay, so if we don't do something about climate change, the economic costs of extreme weather events is going to increase to the point where it overwhelms economic growth. If we do something about climate change, it's going to result in a hit to economic growth. Basically, there's no room left for economic growth, no matter how you look at it. Yes, it's true. It's still, in, on paper, the economy is still growing here in the United States and in China and, and other countries. But even most mainstream economists, if pressed, will tell you there's something else going on here. For some reason, the economy just isn't responding as it should to all of this stimulus and quantitative easing. By now, we really should have seen it take off, and it really hasn't. What's going on here? <clears throat> well, we've had quite a run over the last century, especially since World War II. The economy has been growing and growing and growing, and as it's, as it's done so, we've, we've cheered, you know, more jobs, more consumer products, uh, higher returns on investment, more tax revenues for, for government. Uh, we don't really even notice just how fast the train is going anymore. Nobody bothers to ask. All we care about is, is it accelerating? Is it going faster this year than it was last year? And if we can say yes to that question, then everyone lets out a cheer. But, you know, at the end of the day, we live on a finite planet. And whether it's fossil fuels or whether it's uh, limitations to the ability of the environment to absorb our industrial wastes or whether it's limits to other resources like water and topsoil, we can't keep growing the economy forever. Sooner or later, we have to get used to the idea that economic growth is over. Now, again, we've built an economy designed around growth. So this is going to be a shocking experience for, especially for a lot of professional economists, but for everybody else too. We're going to have to build more resilience into our social systems in order to maintain them in the face of what's coming. Not only economic and financial shocks, but also environmental shocks. So what are we talking about with resilience? In many ways, we're talking about exactly the opposite of what we've been aiming for over the past few decades. We've been aiming for economic efficiency. And one way to describe economic efficiency, of course, I'm oversimplifying, but you could say, well, if we can, if we can make widgets in China cheaper than any place else, then we should make all of our widgets in China. If we can grow corn cheaper in Iowa than any place else, then we should grow all of our corn in Iowa and nothing in Iowa except corn. And we've pretty much done that. But, you know, if, 
if you carry economic efficiency to the, to the bitter end, what you get is a system that is brittle. If the corn crop in Iowa fails, nobody has corn and Iowa has nothing. Right? So economic efficiency certainly has its place, but there's a balancing value that we've forgotten about, which is resilience, the resilience of the entire system. So if we're going to get off growth, we're going to have to do a few things. Uh, I would suggest that, that either replacing or supplementing GDP would be a really good idea because GDP is all about measuring growth. So if we begin to measure human happiness instead, maybe we could find ways of altering the economy, developing the economy that increase human happiness without necessarily increasing the rate of throughput of materials and energy, which is what economic growth actually is all about in the end. I mean, sometimes economists talk about decoupling, but actual decoupling that we've seen is pretty minor. A lot of the economic decoupling we've seen in this country, especially with energy use and pollution, has just been a factor of moving uh, production overseas to China. We, they pollute their environment to produce our consumer goods. That's, that's no solution. Worker ownership of, of companies, factories, cooperatives, as we were hearing about earlier. The, the kinds of uh, the, the ownership systems that we have in place currently, including the stock market, we're really designed, again, under financial conditions of constant growth. If you have a worker-owned company, it, it's free to have values other than constant expansion. It can have values like providing a good product, providing uh, a decent uh, workplace experience for, for workers. We have to begin to take population seriously because if population continues to grow then all of the problems that I've alluded to tonight become worse. You know, if the pie isn't constantly growing then and population is then per capita consumption is going to have to fall and that will create all kinds of problems. So <clears throat> how do we deal with energy and climate, obviously we need to invest much more in renewable energy, take the subsidies away from fossil fuels, give them renewable energy, uh, look at the federal budget, find ways of investing not just a few billion here and there, but hundreds of billions in renewable energy. That said, even if we do that, we're going to be faced with a very different energy economy than we knew during the 20th century. Renewable energy sources have different characteristics from those of fossil fuels. And what we've done over the past century is built our entire societal infrastructure, airports, railways, shipping lines, um, factories, our buildings, all around the unique characteristics of fossil fuels. So as we replace fossil fuels with renewable energy sources, we will have energy sources with different characteristics. And we need to use energy differently to take advantage of the opportunities provided by renewable energy sources. But at the same time, there's some things that renewable energy sources aren't going to do as well as fossil fuels. And so there will be some changes. For example, in transportation, oil is really hard to substitute. We've had this experiment with biofuels here in this country, with, particularly with ethanol over the past few years, and it's been really, frankly, a miserable failure. Biofuels are inherently problematic. You know, here in this country, if you look at the total amount of energy that we use, almost all of it, well, 85% from fossil fuels, versus the total amount of sunlight that is absorbed by all of green nature within the boundaries of the United States, it's about equal. 
So if we were going to try to run our system on biofuels, we would be having to burn the entire year's worth of net primary productivity each year. That's not going to work. We also have to eat. And gee, there are some other species around here who might like to use some of that productivity as well. So we are going to be less mobile is what this all comes down to. We need to relocalize our communities, our economic processes, our food system. We need to rethink our buildings so that they are passive, so they're taking advantage of ambient sources of energy like sunlight, rather than just looking at the building as, as something that, that you know, we, we, we plug in and, and obtain energy from somewhere else to provide the heat, cooling, lighting, and so on. And our food system, probably the most important of all. Again, we've designed our food system around natural gas with which we produce uh, nitrogen fertilizer and oil to run tractors to, uh, to transport inputs to the farm, to transport outputs from the farm, uh, typically 1,500 miles in this country. It's a food system designed to fail under exactly the circumstances that are entirely foreseeable within the next few decades. So some of this could sound a little bit bracing, maybe a little bit um, frightening. OK, yes, there are reasons to be concerned about all of these factors that are facing us. But as we undertake this fundamental economic transition, probably the most important economic transition in the history of our species. How about if we pay attention to the possible benefits? You know, we've had to give up a lot for the optimization of the current economic system. In order to optimize the current economic system, we had to become more individualistic. We had to become consumers we had to become consumers of advertising. And maybe that's not what makes people the best people. You know, maybe being more communitarian, maybe, uh, maybe rather than being consumers who gauge our success by how much we consume, maybe uh, voluntary poverty. Have you ever heard of the, a society that actually valorized voluntary poverty? Well, yeah, almost every previous society in human history. If you look at the world religions, they, they're all about how you know, maximizing your personal consumption is really not something to be applauded. So moving back to a more traditional and uh, humane set of values could not only make us happier, but also better people. So what kind of future is, is ahead of us? Of course, there are the techno-optimists among us who see the future as being more of the same. Um, or it could be you know, Mad Max. The whole thing could just come apart, and, and uh, we, we'd be at each other's throats. It's possible. Um, I don't know how all of this is going to work out. But I, I firmly believe that it's also possible that we can adapt. We, can, we are intelligent, compassionate creatures. And it's entirely possible for us to create new systems, just as we did over the course of the 20th century. How much did we invent, not only in terms of, of mechanical technologies, but also in terms of social and financial systems? We are incredibly innovative as a species. Can you go back to those benefits for one minute? Sure. Thank you. Sure. So <clears throat> it's already happening. I think we're already seeing a lot of folks pre-adapting to what's, what's coming our way. Uh, one thing that we've seen over the last while is the emergence of the transition initiatives all over the planet. 
uh, thousands and thousands of transition towns that are, are not, you know, not waiting for the government to take charge of these problems and fix them, but saying, what can we do in our own communities? Uh, and starting from the assumption that life can be better without fossil fuels. How can we, uh, how can we rebuild our local food shed, our local food system, our local transport system? How can we build a, a local tool library? This just happens to be an example from my hometown of Santa Rosa, California. You've heard of the sharing economy. What, where is this, all of this coming from? Is it just coming out of the ether or people just evolving? Yeah, I think that's what's happening. I think we deeply sense that the system as it is is not working and it's set up to fail in a pretty spectacular way just probably within the next, within the next decade or two. So we're all on the lookout for different ways of making the world work. And a lot of folks are coming up with really exciting, innovative, visionary, compassionate new ways of doing things. And I'm not going to tell you what all of them are because that's what this whole conference is about. All I'll say is, you know, when I talk to young people, um, and I, I used to teach in a college program where, you know, it was a year-long program in the first for the first two months, uh, the uh, students were, were kind of shell-shocked, you know, really, is it? I knew it was bad, but I had no idea. But then after a while, it was like, well, yeah, but we could do this, and we could do this, and we could do that. The reality is, over the course of the next few decades, we will be reinventing almost every aspect of human existence. What an opportunity. What an artistic opportunity, if nothing else. We will have the opportunity to set a, set a lot of things right that maybe we, we didn't get so right over the course of the last century. We, we, get, a, we get a remake, yeah. So in that spirit, in the spirit of, uh, of possibility, I salute you all and thank you for your, your kind attention. Thank you.